This is Al Jazeera. And live from Studio 14 here at Al Jazeera headquarters in Doha, I'm Fuli Batibo. Welcome to the news grid. Fears Syria's largest dam is at imminent risk of collapse. U.S. backed fighters have stopped a military operation against ISIL near the strategic Tabqa Dam as they inch closer to the group stronghold Raqqa. All this as the U.S. deploys more troops to the region. We'll have the very latest on the battle against ISIL. Also on the grid, Theresa May's charm offensive. The British Prime Minister meets Scotland's Nicola Sturgeon, hoping to convince her not to hold a new referendum on independence. But with the Brexit process due to begin this week, is it too little too late? And deep anxiety in Northern Ireland too over Brexit. Is the unity of the UK under threat? And Alexei Navalny, a thorn in Putin's side. Russia's opposition leader is sentenced to 15 days in prison, a day after he led the biggest nationwide rally since 2012. Tens of thousands took to the streets, demanding the resignation of Russia's prime minister over corruption allegations. How will the Kremlin deal with this new wave of discontent? And the latest UN talks may lead to a nuclear weapons ban, but Russia and the U.S. are not attending. Do you think negotiations can be effective without these key players? I'm Leah Harding. Connect with us with the hashtag AJNewsGrid. You're with the News Grid live on air and streaming online through YouTube, Facebook Live and at aljazeera.com. The end game is Raqqa, ISIL's de facto capital in Syria. To get there, U.S.-backed fighters are trying to encircle the city, taking over important installations one by one. The alliance of Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces have been battling for control of an airbase near Tabqa. It lies about 40 kilometers from Raqqa and has been under ISIL control since 2014. But the U.S.-backed fighters had to stop the military operation because of concerns about a damaged dam on the Euphrates River. The Tabqa Dam is Syria's largest. Last month, the U.N. warned that if the dam collapses, there could be massive flooding across Raqqa and even as far away as Deir Ezzor, 140 kilometers downstream. Straight to Beirut and Al Jazeera's Alan Fisher, who's monitoring the situation in Syria for us. Uh, Alan, there was a lot of concern, of course, about the state of this dam. A and now I understand the military operations have stopped, but this is just temporary, right? Exactly right. What we had at the weekend was ISIL touring villages and towns downstream of the dam saying it's going to break. We have real problems with it. The American airstrikes haven't helped. An engineer who worked at the dam was shown pictures of the control room. He said, if this is true, then there is a catastrophe just waiting to happen here. But many others on the ground were saying, look, there's no problem with the dam. It's operating normally. Of course, there's fighting going on in the area. We've seen that for the last week. This is really just ISIL trying to stop uh, the airstrikes against them. What happened then was that the Syrian Democratic Forces said, OK, We'll put in place a four-hour ceasefire so that engineers can get in and check the dam. And just in the last hour, we've heard from Syrian Democratic Forces saying the engineers have been all over the dam. They've looked at the control room. Everything is fine. Everything is working normally. So we expect in the coming hours the fighting to restart. Certainly there were thousands of people who were concerned about the warnings that were issued from ISIL over the weekend that flooding was a real possibility. And of course we've heard from the United Nations that were that dam to break we'd be facing another humanitarian crisis in Syria. So for the moment, according to the Syrian Democratic Forces in the last hour, they say that everything in the dam is okay. Right. So, and the SDF, Alan, uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces are inching closer to Raqqa, ISIL stronghold. Tell us about the latest gains they have made. How much progress and how much longer do they anticipate this uh, fight to, to continue? Well, they're not giving a timescale on how long the fight will, will uh, take, but what they're saying is that Takba, they've taken back control of a military airfield there. Now, that was a Syrian military airfield which uh, was lost to ISIL in 2014. Overnight, we were told that the Syrian Democratic Forces, which, of course, you'll remember, is a, 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 essentially a coalition of Arab fighters and the Kurds backed up by the United States with air power and U.S. Special Forces on the ground helping to direct operations. They said that they'd taken over 80% of the airbase. Just in the last couple of hours, they now say that they have 100% control 
of the airbase. There were some pockets of ISIL fighters who were staging a last stand, but they have now been cleared out. Whether they have run away or whether they've been killed, not entirely clear. Now, it's the SDF's intention to use that airbase for aircraft. The difficulty is that the tarmacs will have to be, and the runways will have to be uh, treated relayed, repaired, mm. and also there is an additional problem in that a number of uh, landmines have been placed in the area and booby traps, so they will have to be cleared out before that becomes an operational airfield again. Alan Fisher in Beirut, thank you very much for that update, Alan. Now joining us on the news grid is Hyde Hyde, he's a Syria researcher at Chatham House, he's live from London. Very good to have you with us on the news grid. So as we've said uh, about the dam first, I want to get your views on this. Earlier this year, the UN warned of the risk of catastrophic flooding from the Takba Dam. What do you see as the biggest risk today? Is it the airstrikes by the US-led coalition near the dam or perhaps deliberate sabotage by ISIL? I think we, we consider both as uh, imminent threats because the footage that were released recently show that uh, one, one uh, area inside the uh, dam was attacked by the U.S.-led coalition. The U.S.-led coalition uh, said that they don't use uh, high uh, explosive uh, uh, bombs in that area, so the damage is not that big. But people, people on the ground, they are still scared, and they, they don't know what's happening. Mm. They just know that th there is a possibility that the dam might uh, explode. And then the ICE is using those rumors, whether they're true or not, that this is a possibility that right. means that ISIS could also use that as a way to basically damage the reputation of the US-led coalition and uh, turn people basically against them. Yeah, by so people using, are uh, worried, uh, as you say. Uh, that, that, yeah. Just help us understand a bit more the strategic value of, of this dam. How many people does it affect and how does it factor into the overall operation on, on Raqqa, ISIL stronghold? Well, uh, it affects, I think, thousands of people, but the accurate number is quite difficult to say because many people, they left the area. We don't know how many people exactly live uh, in, in those areas, but it's, we, we know that thousands of people would be um, affected, that's for sure. As for the importance of this dam, uh, I think mainly the dam provides uh, Raqqa with water and mm. with electricity, not only Raqqa, but other areas that are controlled by ISIS. So if the U.S.-led coalition will be able to control that, then they will be able to basically uh, um, prevent ISIS from being sure. able to continue to provide services in those areas, and that will be a uh, big damage to the reputation of, the, of ISIS in those areas. Right. I, I want to bring up now this map of, of Raqqa for our viewers and its surrounding region to, to give us um, a better idea of who controls what and the progress made by the U.S.-led forces. Let's bring up this map, which is on our website, aljazeera.com. Uh, Let's scroll down just a little bit and take a look at the areas in red. Um, well, hopefully we'll have that map. But just to give our viewers a, a better idea... Um, Mr. Hyde Hyde, uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces have made big gains in, in recent weeks, controlling uh, larger areas uh, around ISIL, but obviously there are still uh, key areas that are still under the control of the group. What do you think this battle is going to, what is it going to take, I mean, for the SDF fighters to regain uh, Raqqa? And if it does happen, what happens next? Will that mean the end necessarily? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have to highlight here an important issue, which is that all the fighting that is happening right now around Raqqa is to isolate Raqqa. And the fighting is taking place in uh, small villages and open areas, which is why the SDF forces have been able to make uh, rapid, uh, uh, basically, advances, and they were able to control most of those areas. But the fighting, the actual fighting, will most likely happen inside uh, Raqqa, which is what ISIS is usually uh, does, because the street and fighting will allow them to basically uh, cause more damage to the SDF forces and then to reduce the impact of the U.S.-led coalition airstrikes. So this is why they're bringing people to in street uh, fighting. That's what uh, the um, fighting. The, yeah, streets fighting. That's one. The, oh. the other issue is that uh, they have 
as we uh, we saw in other places, they have booby traps and all the mines right. that attack civilians uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, armed vehicles. So this is why they will they want to bring the fight into Raqqa in order to have the upper hand there. Mm. But the the biggest fight we. I think we have to differentiate between two issues. The actual fighting that will take place in Raqqa, which will lead to uh, casualties among civilians, which will be uh, a, a high concern. The other concern is what will happen after Raqqa, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so far, there is no agreement among the regional or international players on who will basically take over Raqqa. Okay. Uh, some people, they're saying that uh, uh, Arab forces within the SDF will control Raqqa. But what we saw in other places like in Mimbej, yes. the SDF didn't allow there's, those people there's precisely to control a question, Raqqa by themselves. Uh, there's precisely a question on that, Haider, on, uh, on the control and what happens next. But one of our viewers here on WhatsApp, Hatem, who says, seeing the examples of El Bab and other areas, wouldn't Turkish forces be a better option for the U.S. rather than the Kurdish forces? Well, it's difficult to say at this point because the, it's not an option so far. The, the U.S. has shown that they are committed to continue the fight with the SDF and they are not willing to uh, do the same with the Kurdish forces. And they mainly say that they don't have that option because the, uh, the uh, Turkish-led forces are not ready to mm. go and uh, take over Raqqa at this point. So this is why... Uh, if you look from the possibility of uh, 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 of what's available on the ground, this is not an option. But people might have different opinions on who they prefer to do. I think most of all, what they want to do is, or what they want to achieve is, someone to allow them to con to participate in governing their own areas, and someone who will basically allow them to basically pro pro provide them with uh, services that will. Uh, enable them to have some kind of uh, okay. normal life uh, okay. in, in those areas. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us there from London. Hyde Hyder, Syria researcher at Chatham House, joining us on the news grid. Thank you very much for your time. Now, defeating ISIL is also the goal in Iraq and the ongoing battle for Mosul. The fallout is deepening from an incident of mass civilian deaths in the west of the city. More than 200 people are said to have been killed in coalition airstrikes 10 days ago. The commander of U.S. forces in the Middle East describes the deaths as a terrible tragedy, but he stopped short of taking responsibility for them. Now, as the battle for Mosul intensifies, the U.S. is increasing its military presence on the battlefield. The Pentagon confirms that more than 200 troops are being sent to Iraq as reinforcements in the fight against ISIL. They join the more than 5,000 U.S. soldiers already active in the country. And earlier this month, the Pentagon dispatched an extra 500 troops to Syria and placed 1,000 more on standby in Kuwait. Live to Alan Schaufler in Washington, D.C. So, Alan, any more detail about these additional U.S. troops that are being deployed? What is going to be their role and when are they going to be deployed? You know, we haven't heard much from the uh, Department of Defense, the Pentagon, on specifics, exactly how many troops, and they're not giving us a timeline either. What we understand, though, is that it's two to 300 troops at this point, uh, members of the 82nd Airborne, a U.S. Army Infantry Division. They will be going to uh, assist Iraqi forces in liberating Mosul. Their mission is being called uh, a non-enduring temporary mission. That's the current military phraseology. They'll be advise, advising and assisting Iraqi forces. So 200, perhaps more, perhaps as many as 300 uh, airborne soldiers mm -hmm. advising and assisting. A bump up in U.S. presence, certainly in that area, but not much of one at this point. And no details, uh, Foley, about exactly when they might be on the ground. Sure. And what does this, Alan, suggest about um, the Trump administration's strategy against ISIL? Are they ramping up? Well, it certainly suggests more engagement. And while this is a fairly small number, 200, possibly more troops, they're members of a 4,000-person uh, uh, brigade, a 4,000-unit combat brigade. A little less than half of that brigade is currently deployed in Iraq and also in Kuwait. If we start seeing the rest of that brigade deployed into the region, that could be a real indication uh, of the administration's uh, plans to put more American troops 
on the ground and be more engaged with, with more than just advising and assisting. But the Pentagon so far saying that the rest of that force of that 4,000 brigade combat team is not being deployed to the region at this point. So right now what we're seeing is more engagement, more troops, and a possible indicator that uh, that might be ramping up, but no official confirmation and no details from the Trump administration from the political side of this about exactly what the plans are for helping in the defeat of Islamic State. Thank you very much for that. Alan Schaffler, live for us in Washington. Now, some of the people who've managed to escape the fighting in Mosul, Iraq, say they've been living under constant bombardment. Al Jazeera's Hoda Abdelhamid has been speaking to some of them, a warning that some of you may find the, the pictures in her report disturbing. They had watched the war unfolding in the east of Mosul, rejoicing at the news that it had been recaptured. But as Iraqi forces advanced west, ISIL fighters retreated among them. Umm Bilal says she and her neighbors were besieged the fighting intensified. There was no food and no help except for one another. We were bombed from all sides. There were mortar rounds, but we don't know if they were being fired by the army or ISIL. We all stayed together in one room. It was petrifying. There was constant shelling and intense bombing from the air. The house was trembling as if it was an earthquake. The strikes were so powerful. Her son, already disabled, was injured by a mortar shell. When the army approached, ISIL kicked us out of our home. To escape, we went from one block to another. We hid in houses. Sometimes we were up to 90 people under one roof. All the patients here are from western Mosul. It has seen the toughest fighting yet. From room to room, they tell stories of frequent airstrikes. Ahmed says it's the aerial attacks that are causing most casualties. This man's story is the most heart-wrenching. He was in his house with his eight children, his wife and members of his extended family. In total they were 22 when it was hit by an airstrike. Everybody died except for him and he stayed under the rubble for about five days before he was rescued. His face is burnt, one leg and one arm are broken. A relative tells us he still hasn't realized that he lost everything, family and home. There is no liberation without destruction, says Saad. His cousin Ghanem is lying in bed too weak to talk. He broke his leg and shrapnel tore through his abdomen. Wherever there is the army and ISIL, everything turns to rubble. ISIL sets everything on fire before retreating. Schools, clinics, government buildings, private homes, cars, all went in flames. Ghanem's wife is not far away, in the female ward. She's just come out of surgery. Their son Zakaria complains about the stitches. He's restless and longs to see his father. So Saad carries him through the dim corridor, and Zakaria finally settles down. A moment of joy for a father and son in pain. Abdel Hamid, Al Jazeera in northern Iraq. And there's an interesting uh, comment here from one of our viewers on Facebook, Teresa, who writes, getting ISIS out of Iraq is what Iraqis want, despite past U.S. mistakes look forward. Thank you for that comment, Teresa. And there's an interesting opinion piece on our website about what the Trump administration's strategy against ISIL is. Joe Macaron, a policy analyst at the Arab Center in Washington, says uh, what President Trump is doing right now is basically a continuation of the Obama strategy. Uh, the U.S. wants to focus on the elimination of ISIL by military force, but leave reconstruction efforts to its allies. It's a very interesting perspective. You can find it on our website site aljazeera.com. Don't forget, as always, we're looking forward to hearing your questions and comments on this and other stories we're covering on the News Grid on Facebook Live. You can connect with us, facebook.com slash ajnewsgrid. On Twitter as well, our handle, at ajenglish. You can also WhatsApp us. The number is on your screen, plus 974 501 
Now to the UK and Prime Minister Theresa May is visiting Scotland this Monday. It's part of her plan to engage with all the nations of the United Kingdom before she formally launches Britain's exit from the European Union. She's due to trigger Article 50 of the EU's Lisbon Treaty on Wednesday, beginning two years of formal divorce talks. May is setting out areas she believes her government and Scottish leaders can agree on with regards to Brexit. She says she wants the best deal for the whole of the United Kingdom. For we stand on the threshold of a significant moment for Britain as we begin the negotiations that will lead us towards a new partnership with Europe. And I want to make it absolutely clear as we move through this process that this is not in any sense the moment that Britain steps back from the world. Indeed, we are going to take this opportunity to forge a more global Britain, the closest friend and ally with Europe, but also a country that looks beyond Europe to build relationships with old friends and new allies alike. Here's Al Jazeera's Nadim Babana with more from Edinburgh. Well, what we know for certain is that on Tuesday, the Scottish Parliament here in Edinburgh will wrap up their debate on uh, the uh, formal process of asking Westminster for the right to hold another independence referendum. And then on Wednesday, the British government will formally hand over the letter triggering uh, Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, starting a two-year process of leaving the European Union. On Monday, the uh, meeting between the British Prime Minister Theresa May and Nicola Sturgeon, although it's supposed to be uh, about technicalities of Article 50, is sure to uh, involve some very, very um, opposing views on Brexit itself and what it means for the future of the Union. Theresa May, uh, earlier on Monday elsewhere in Scotland, told civil servants that... Um, that Britain was a, a fantastic uh, force when it acted together, particularly uh, on foreign aid, uh, highlighting the need for union. She said also, though, that um, triggering Article 50 uh, would be a great moment for the whole nation. Well, political trouble is also lurking in another part of the UK. In Northern Ireland, the deadline has now passed for the formation of a power-sharing government. The two largest parties, the DUP and Sinn Féin, have so far failed to agree on a new executive following snap elections earlier this month. Without a devolved government, Northern Ireland could be in limbo as the process of Brexit is triggered on Wednesday. Let's bring in our next guest now on the news grid, Peter Gagan. He's a political analyst and lecturer at the University of West Scotland. He's via Skype from Glasgow. Thank you so much for joining us. So, as Nadim just said there, Theresa May's visit to Scotland comes just one day before the parliament there is expected to pass a vote in favour of seeking a new referendum. And she said in the past that now is not the time for a Scottish independence referendum. Do you think the Scottish parliament will hear this message? No, I think she, she's reiterated that during this trip again, saying that you know now is not the time. Um, we need to wait before it could be a possible second referendum. No, I don't think there's any chance at all the Scottish Parliament uh, tomorrow not voting through this mm. bill, which will call for the transfer of power to the Scottish Parliament to hold a second referendum. Symbolically, it's a very important week as well. Obviously, it's coming the day before she triggers Article 50, right. which will see the... Britain heading towards Brexit, leaving the European Union. And it's really important to remember as well that Scotland voted uh, to remain in the European Union by quite a large majority, while the rest of the UK, uh, England and Wales voted to leave. Sure. So I think Nicola Sturgeon, Scottish leader, feels that she has the weight of Scottish opinion on her side, mm. but Theresa May feels that she has the backing of the UK itself. And I think there's very little sign from what we've seen today of Theresa May in Scotland. She was in East Kilbride outside of Glasgow. You know, she's talked a lot about the importance of the Union, but there's very little sense, I think, that the two sides are going to get any closer together. If anything, they seem to be drifting further apart. Right. And Nicola Sturgeon wants to hold a new referendum in the autumn of 2018 or spring of 2019. But again, this is up to Downing Street, isn't it? Who's got the upper hand right now? Yes, under the, devol the devolution settlement, which set up the Scottish Parliament almost 20 years ago, the Union, the United Kingdom itself, is a reserved matter. That means that Scotland, the Scottish Parliament, cannot have any, uh, cannot rule on this issue. So, as in 2014, when it held the last referendum on independence, they had to ask the UK government to give them permission. That's what they want to do again. They want to ask for what's called a Section 30 order. Right. So they can't hold another referendum unless that's given. And I think there's not a strong sense that, that that's going to happen anytime soon because three 
Theresa May is saying no. So I think politically the two sides are going to become increasingly up against one another. And this, is a, this could go on for quite a long time because the Brexit process is not going to end anytime soon. Peter Gagan, there's discontent in Northern Ireland too where there's a political impasse. They can't agree on forming a new government. Uh, the nationalist parties there have made big gains. What are the options as far as Northern Ireland is concerned? And, we you know, with the whole status of Northern Ireland up in the air, Scotland has one foot out the door, it seems. Where does this leave the United Kingdom? Uh, certainly, Brexit is asking fundamental questions about the United Kingdom uh, in a way that I think has surprised a lot of people who were very pro-Brexit, people who supported leaving the European Union because they felt that you know, the United Kingdom was where power should be devolved to. But for nationalists in Scotland, and as you say in Northern Ireland, there is a sense that Brexit has actually really fundamentally changed their relationship with, with the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, we, uh, the kind of the deadline, which is 4 p.m. today, to set up a new power-sharing government in Northern Ireland has passed. We're waiting to hear what the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, James Brokenshire, what does he say? Could we see we could be heading towards either another election in Northern Ireland or a long period of direct rule from Westminster? And I think in places like Scotland and Northern Ireland, there is a sense that these kind of fraying edges of the union, that the United Kingdom is coming under a lot more stress and a lot more. St than I think even has possibly ever come under before. If you go back to 2014 in Scotland, even though the vote was quite close, it was 55 to 45 in favour of staying in the United Kingdom, the politics have changed a lot. Most people vote in, in both Northern Ireland and Scotland to stay in the European Union. And the big political parties have shifted a lot too. Nationalist parties are doing much better now in Scotland and in Northern Ireland than they were three or four years ago. So I think Theresa May is going to come under increasing pressure from nationalists uh, who are either going to look for full independence or for some sort of new settlement. Uh, whether that means if the Northern Ireland a new relationship between Dublin and Belfast and London or in terms of Scotland greater devolution. Peter Gagan, thank you so much for your insights. Good to have you on the news grid. Thanks for joining us there from Glasgow. And, you know, lots of comments on this story coming uh, from our viewers on Facebook, on, on Twitter as well. A comment here from Darren in the UK who says the United Kingdom is finished. Scotland will be independent within the next couple of years. And uh, Frank, also on Facebook, says the UK is finished and no one to blame but itself. Sad. You can keep those comments coming. Use the hashtag AJ Newsgrid. And, you know, we've talked about how the UK could be affected by Brexit. But what about the other side? What about the EU? Read this very interesting piece on our website looking at how the UK leaving the bloc would affect the European Union with uh, populist parties on the rise. Will more countries abandon the European Union? Very important question asked there. And also to, to better understand Europe and where we are today, Al Jazeera has put together this great interactive, The Big Picture, The Making and Breaking of Europe which explores the interwoven history of the European projects from the 1940s to today. It's extremely informative. Do check it out on aljazeera.com. Just click on the More tab and then click on Interactive. All right, we're now at our multi-view wall, looking at all the pictures coming to us here on Al Jazeera. Not sure what's going on here, but I'll, I'll find out and tell you in just a few minutes. In the meantime, let's check in with Jonah Hall in London for the rest of the day's news. Jonah. Folly, thank you. And we begin in the Philippines, where three Malaysian sailors have been found alive eight months after they were kidnapped by the armed group Abu Sayyaf. They were among a group seized from a tugboat in waters between the southern Philippines and Malaysia last July. Well, last week, two other Malaysians from the same vessel were found by a Philippine patrol vessel drifting in a boat off Jolo. Jamela Alindogan has more now on the developments from Manila. The three Malaysian nationals rescued today were part of the five that were abducted in Lahadato in eastern Malaysia last July of 2016. And according to the Philippine military, they were rescued through joint operations and are now on their way to Zamboanga City, one of the main islands in the southern Philippines. Now, the issue of piracy and kidnapping of criminal activities by the Abu Sayyaf has long been a problem in this part of the Sulu and the Celebes Sea, where the Philippines shares borders with Malaysia in Indonesia. But over the last few years, the situation has been very difficult. In fact, since President Rodrigo took office, the number of hostages of the Abu Sayyaf has more than doubled, and majority of them are in fact foreigners. Now, the Philippine military has signed a peace agree uh, joint patrol agreement between Indonesia and Malaysia, hoping to really curb the issue of piracy in this part of the southern Philippines. Now, the Philippine military has also put a deadline, a self-imposed deadline of making sure that the the presence of the Abu Sayyaf is eliminated by the end of June. 
Myanmar's military commander has used his annual Armed Forces Day speech to denounce the claim to citizenship of Rohingya Muslims. They're widely regarded as illegal immigrants in Myanmar and around 100,000 are confined to camps. Wayne Hay reports. Under military rule, Armed Forces Day provided the world a rare glimpse of a secretive regime. Since an election in 2010, Myanmar has opened up and is democratizing. But that doesn't mean the annual parade is a symbol of the past. Instead, it's a sign of how powerful the military still is. We have a duty to do what we should do according to the law, and we also have a duty to protect our sovereignty when it is harmed by political, religious and racial problems in the country. The commander left no doubt how he feels about the rights of stateless Rohingya Muslims who are being kept in camps in Rakhine State. The Rohingya aren't recognized as one of Myanmar's ethnic groups. The commander's speech came just days after the United Nations said it would send a team to investigate allegations of rape and murder by security forces. We have already let the world know that we don't have Rohingya in our country. The Bengalis in Rakhine state are not Myanmar citizens and they are just people who come and stay in the country. There are also allegations of rights abuses by government soldiers in other parts of the country where civil war continues. Peace talks with ethnic minority armies appear to have stalled. For the third consecutive year, Myanmar's state councillor Aung San Suu Kyi was missing from the parade. Because she had a foreign husband and has foreign children, she is prevented from becoming the president by a military-drafted constitution that enshrines its power. Serving soldiers fill a quarter of the seats in parliament and the military controls key security ministries. Changing the constitution without military support is impossible. Mia A is a former student who spent 12 years in jail for protesting against the military government and he thinks it's time they stepped back from politics. The military is involved in politics because of the situation in the country, but I don't see any unity between people and the army. In order to earn respect from people, it's not good for the military to be involved in politics. There are no real external threats to Myanmar's sovereignty. Its challenges are domestic, and after running the country for almost 50 years, it'll take a lot longer for the armed forces to relinquish control completely. Wayne Hay, Al Jazeera, Yangon. Well, that's it from us for now. More in a bit. Back to you, Folly, in Doha. Jonah, thank you very much. We'll see you in a few minutes. Now, we've got plenty more coming up on the news grid. A major opposition figure is sentenced in Russia as anti-corruption protests continue across the country. More on this in just a few minutes. Do stay with us on Al Jazeera.
headlines on Al Jazeera and what's trending on our website, aljazeera.com. Top trending there, U.S.-backed forces capture an airbase in Syria from ISIL. Also, how Arab airlines are mocking the Trump administration's electronic span. Very popular on aljazeera.com. And also, Iraqis sharing their stories. They hit the oppressed after being liberated from ISIL. All those stories and much more on our website, aljazeera.com. Here with the news grid, we've got people watching today from Afghanistan, Uganda and Canada. Thank you so much for being with us. Remember, you can have your say on today's news by sending your questions and comments for us, our correspondents and our guests. All the different ways to do that on the top right of your screen right now. The hashtag as ever, AJ Newsgrid. Now, he is one of the fiercest critics of the Russian government and he's in court following a show of defiance not seen in years. Opposition leader Alexei Navalny was arrested at an anti-corruption protest in Moscow on Sunday. He's been sentenced to 15 days in prison and fined $350 for organizing what police describe an illegal protest. He'll also spend 15 days in jail for disobeying a police officer. Several protests were held across Russia demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev over corruption allegations. Let's bring in Mark Galiotti now. He's a fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. He's via Skype from Prague. Thank you so much, Mark, for being on the news grid. You know, since 2014, the Russian government has pushed through a number of laws which have restricted protests. And yet, on Sunday, we saw huge protests, not just in Moscow, but in much more diverse places than we've seen in the past. And now you have Alexei Navalny calling for these protests to continue. How worried do you think the Russian government is right now? I think they must be really very worried. After all, as you say, this is the first time we've really seen since 2011, 2012, major protests in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and probably the first time since 1991 that there's been serious protests across the country more broadly. Um, and the very fact, therefore, that, that Navalny has been able to galvanize them, and not just galvanize them, but particularly focusing on official corruption uh, as an issue, after all, which pretty much unites every Russian in their dislike of it. Um, I think it actually says something about the kind of movement that, that he's building. And also the response, I think, tells us that actually the Kremlin is not currently sure what to do. Last night, they cracked down really quite hard, hundreds of arrests across Moscow in particular, and some really quite, quite brutal scenes. And yet today we see the courts, which are under the Kremlin's control, giving Navalny a relatively minor sentence. Right. So I, don't, I think they're not quite sure. It's true that Navalny's message of anti-corruption seems to have hit a, a raw nerve. But why is he going after the Prime Minister, Dmitry Medvedev, and not President Putin himself? It's actually quite a clever strategy. I think he's realized two things. One is that going directly after Putin probably would be crossing a red line. I think that is something that really would uh, trigger a very, very negative response from the Kremlin. And he needs to tread a fine line. Enough to, to get notice, but not enough to trigger a crackdown. But secondly, the fact is Medvedev himself has made a, a series of gaffes. And in particular, I mean, the anti-corruption foundation that Navalny heads managed to very cleverly discover a whole series of properties that he owns, including vineyards and such like, mm. um, which then they were able to put to the public. So he was both vulnerable, but not too politically dangerous. Elections are due in one year now, in March 2018, and Alexei Navalny intends to run, but of course he's barred from doing so uh, after being found guilty in a case which he says was politicized. How do you think President Putin will respond if these protests continue, if they don't die, die down? You know, how will the Kremlin deal with this new wave of discontent and Alexei Navalny? Well, we think... There's two things, issue, two things here, really. One is dealing with Navalny. Now, look, Navalny has been in and out of prison, and in some ways, actually putting him in prison just simply makes him a martyr. Now, I think it's unlikely that at this stage they'd be thinking about anything more dramatic, shall we say. But this is the thing. They actually have to find some way of silencing him. The other question is what they do about the protests. Now, we don't know if the protests will, will continue. It's unlikely to be anything on quite the same scale immediately. But the point is, if Navalny can continue to get these sort of numbers, and particularly new people to his protests, then it comes to the point where, where the Kremlin is either going to have to crack down or else do something quite dramatic to try and take the wind out of Navalny's sails. One of these is dangerous, and as well as the second one, I don't think this Kremlin can crack down on corruption.
A quick question here from one of our viewers, Mark, uh, from Sakala on Facebook, who asks how many candidates in Russia's presidential election, because it's still unclear whether President Putin is actually going to run himself. Look, I think we can be pretty certain that Putin is running. Everything is, is geared up for that. And he wants not just to win, but essentially to have a sort of a virtual coronation of result. We don't know yet how many people will be standing because they don't have to. I mean, on the whole, there will almost certainly be a candidate from the Communist Party. Navalny is claiming that he's going to stand. We'll wait and see. We don't really know. But essentially, the only competition at the moment that matters is how many votes can Navalny get. He won't win. But if he can stand and get a good sum of votes, that will be a major blow. Mark Gallieni, thank you so much. Very good to talk to you. Mark Galliotti from the European Council on Foreign Relations joining us there via Skype from Prague. Thank you. Let's now bring in our social media producer, Leah, and a lot of conversation still today on these protests in Russia. Right, Folly. Well, it's been a day now since the largest unsanctioned protests in Russia, but the movement is still very much trending online. You can see here the traction of these protests and what they had around the world. This map following the hashtag Dmitry will answer relating to corruption allegations against Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev. This hashtag has been used more than 48,000 times just in the last day. Now we're tracking protests across Russia. But so far, there are no protests today linked to the corruption allegations. But among those using the hashtag I was just talking about, Dmitry will answer, is Alexei Navalny, the man who organized Sunday's protest, calling for Medvedev to resign. Now, Navalny is one of the Kremlin's hardest critics. He's been live tweeting, though, from the court uh, from the courtroom after he was arrested. He posted this picture here earlier today from court. The title, he says, well, the time will come when we will judge them. He's been since, since sentenced to 15 days in jail for organizing the protest. Now, the U.S. State Department has condemned the arrest of hundreds of protesters, mostly students. They tweeted saying detaining peaceful protesters is an affront to democratic values. Russia has also responded and said many of the protesters were paid to participate. Now, among those arrested was Guardian journalist Alec Lund. He posted this picture in the back of a police van with others who were arrested at the protest. He was later released, though, a few hours later. When I kept uh, looking through pictures of the protest, I kept finding pictures of plastic yellow ducks like this one. Protesters had signs and banners with the ducks on them, poking fun at Medvedev's luxury items, including an alleged house he has for raising ducks. Protesters also wore tennis shoes around their necks, like this man here, making fun of fancy shoes that Medvedev has been photographed wearing mocking his seemingly lavish lifestyle. Now, one user on Instagram asked Medvedev directly how his day was during the corruption protests, and he responded saying, quote, not bad, I was skiing. Well, are you following this story? If you are, be sure to use the hashtag AJNewsGrid, or you can always write to me directly at Leah Harding, AJE. Folly? Leah, thank you very much for that. And many comments on Russia as well on the news grid today. Patrick on Facebook writes, Putin is the only candidate suitable for Russia for now. And another comment here from Elegu, Putin doesn't want Navalny dominance in Russian politics. A lot of people interested in this story, Leah. Thank you very much for that. Let's now go back to our London News Centre once again for a look at the rest of the day's news with John Hall. Thanks, Farley. Well, at an investment conference here in the UK, Qatar has said there will be more investment opportunities in the country. Its finance minister has announced $6 billion of investment over the next three to five years. Qatar is already a high-profile investor in London and owns many landmarks, including the Shard, the Harrods department store and the Olympic Village. We are looking beyond the boundaries of our own continent, ready to embrace all the opportunities of this new era. This, of course, means forging new ties and building new relationships with other nations. But perhaps more importantly, it means strengthening our commitment to our oldest friends and allies. And Qatar is one of the most valued of these. An avalanche has killed seven high school students and a teacher during their mountain climb in Japan. They were among a group of 40 pupils and eight teachers on a trip when the avalanche swept down a hillside near a ski resort in Nasu, north of Tokyo. 
An avalanche warning from a local meteorological observatory was in place for the area at the time of the accident. An investigation is underway to determine why the group was climbing when an alert had been triggered. More than 225,000 uh, people have been told to evacuate their homes as a Category 4 cyclone with winds of up to 275 kilometres per hour heads towards Australia. Cyclone Debbie is expected to make landfall north of Mackay on the Queensland coast at about 2000 GMT on Monday. Authorities are warning the cyclone could coincide with high tide. Two technicians have been arrested after an escalator in Hong Kong suddenly reversed direction at high speed, injury, injuring at least 18 people. The pair are suspected of tampering with the escalator at the Langham Palace shopping centre. An investigation into what happened is still ongoing. And that is it for me for this news hour. Back to Folly in Doha. Jonah, thank you very much for that. Now, it's playing out as a battle between the haves and have-nots. More than 120 UN member states are starting talks on a global nuclear weapons ban. But nuclear powers, including Britain, France, Russia and the United States, reject the initiative. So, what stockpiles are we talking about? Old Cold War adversaries, the United States and Russia, each have around 7,000 nuclear weapons and are both investing heavily in expanding and modernizing their arsenal. India and Pakistan are both nuclear armed and have a history of tensions along their border. North Korea, as you know, is an aspiring nuclear power and has conducted several tests in recent years. And Iran recently reached a deal with the international community to curb its nuclear program. Well, almost 40 countries, as I said, are not taking part in the UN General Assembly meeting. The United States is one of them. Here's the U.S. ambassador to the UN. We have to be realistic. Is there anyone that believes that North Korea would agree to a ban on nuclear weapons. So what you would see is the General Assembly would go through in good faith trying to do something, but North Korea would be the one cheering and all of the, us and the people we represent would be the ones at risk. For more on this story, let's now speak to Russell Whiting. He's a parliamentary officer with the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and is live from London. Russell, very good to have you with us. So more than 100 countries taking part, but the key players, the U.S., Russia, are not there. What's the point? Can anything be achieved at this conference? Well, we're obviously very disappointed that our own government here in the U.K. isn't attending either. But I think the, the key point to come out of this conference is the fact that the international consensus on nuclear weapons is moving towards the position that we all share uh, and the governments even not attending claim to share and that is that we want to see a world without nuclear weapons. We've seen uh, in the past in Hiroshima and Nagasaki the devastating effects that these weapons right. uh, would have if used. The, the weapons we're talking about these days are, are much more sophisticated, much more powerful. So this is a good chance for the international community as a whole, 123 nations uh, from around the world to come together and to declare that this current position of intransigence from the nuclear weapon states isn't good enough and it's time to start making real progress towards a world free of nuclear weapons. But Russell, even Japan, the only country who have suffered atomic attacks, voted against these talks, saying that the lack of consensus over uh, the negotiations could undermine progress on effective uh, nuclear disarmament. So even if Japan is disagreeing with these talks. Can, again, anything be achieved there of substance? Well, despite voting against uh, the establishment of the conference, Japan is actually taking part. Uh, they are sending representatives to, to take part. But as with any negotiation, I think you start off uh, with the ambition to achieve a consensus. If at the end of a negotiation you don't like what's been put on the table, obviously there's a chance to, to take action at that point. But I think um, Japan, certainly the government of Japan, has come under uh, a terrific amount of pressure to take part. Uh, CND at the moment is hosting two survivors of the Hiroshima bombing in, in Britain, doing a tour to promote this uh, ban treaty negotiations. And the fact that Japan is attending, even though it came under... Um, a terrific amount of pressure from the United States and others really shows that there is an international consensus on this issue. Briefly, the Obama administration, as you know, advocated a world with, without nuclear weapons. Donald Trump, the new U.S. president, 
during the campaign hinted uh, at an arms race with Russia. It seems that the voices for nuclear disarmament are being overtaken by the voices for nuclear deterrence. Do you think nuclear activism is perhaps a thing of the past now that not many people are interested in it anymore? I think there certainly, um, it certainly is the case that the younger generation aren't aware of the threat that these weapons pose in the same way that uh, older generations were who lived through things like the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and the 1980s where there was a very real fear. Uh, CND is growing uh, as an organization here in the UK. Just last year we had over 70,000 people on the streets to protest at our own nuclear weapons system. Millions of people from around the world have signed a petition calling for nuclear weapons to be okay. banned. And it's worth remembering that the 123 states that are taking part well, will represent many, many hundreds of millions and billions of people from around the globe. Thank you so much for speaking to us, Russell Whiting, from the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, live there in London. And Leah is back with us for more on this story, Leah. We'll follow. We put a call out on our Twitter page asking you what you think about this and if these types of talks are even effective without key players like the U.S. and Russia. Eric Erickson here, he says it's meaningless if those who matter do not participate in these talks. Basio saying a ban will never be respected by any nuclear armed country, that U.N. conventions are disposable words on paper, Madulika, he, she says, because nothing says power other than nuclear power. We've been talking to many of you online, and we got this little soundbite out of Germany via Twitter. Take a listen. Norm banning nuclear weapons would force the U.S. and Russia to react, especially if their friends and allies support the norm. There is much more out there than military power to force the state to change their policy. And I think a nuclear ban would do so, so I hope we get nuclear weapons banned. Russia and the, U and the United States are the countries with the biggest stockpile of nuclear weapons, as you can see here in comparison to the rest of the world. Now, the conversation did pick up online with a lot of activists around the world supporting the prospect of a ban. This picture, for example, just lost it there for you, but uh, in Trafalgar Square in London, nuclear weapons are the only weapon of mass destruction that are still legal, biological weapons, chemical weapons, all illegal. We have a call out on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Use the hashtag AJNewsGrid. Leah, thank you very much for that. More on the NewsGrid coming up very shortly, but first some weather pictures from around the world. out of Hong Kong before we go, where police are pressing charges against protest leaders more than two years after their protests took place. This follows the uh, selection of Carrie Lam as the territory's new leader. She's promised to heal divisions. Adrian Brown has more from Hong Kong. There is no love loss between Hong Kong police and the leaders of the Occupy movement. They faced each other for three months during occasionally violent protests. Last month, seven police officers were jailed for attacking an Occupy activist 
who himself is now in prison. Now, more than two years after the occupation of central Hong Kong ended, some of those who helped to organize the protests have been charged. One of them is Tanya Chan, a legislator and barrister. It's easily related to the seven police officers who assaulted um, uh, Ken Zhang, as well as uh, well some other following events. So, um, well, you think it's connected? Well, I think they want people to relate this kind, uh, these two events. The accused were charged just 24 hours after Carrie Lam was selected as Hong Kong's next leader when she promised to heal the city's deep divisions. Benny Tai is a founder of the Occupy movement. He told the crowd he might face a long legal battle, but whatever the outcome, the fight for universal suffrage would go on. On Monday, Carrie Lam met the outgoing chief executive, C.Y. Lung, who's taken a hardline approach to civil dissent and has just been appointed to China's top advisory body. He's also under investigation for corruption. Carrie Lam insists she didn't know about these arrests in advance, but government critics question the timing of the move, suggesting the authorities may have delayed their case against the activists until after the election so as not to damage her campaign. Lam denies the arrests were politically motivated, reminding the media it was the Department of Justice, an independent body that makes decisions on prosecutions. Adrian Brown, Al Jazeera, Hong Kong. And finally on the news grid today, it's probably a thought that's crossed the mind of anyone who's gone ice fishing. What if the ice breaks and one falls in? Well, that's exactly what happened to one man in Estonia. Luckily for him, the nation's emergency services were well trained for that very scenario. This video was released by the rescue board and shows a team speeding across the lake to help dislodge a man from ice and taking back to land. Incredibly, the entire operation from the moment the call was made took just... 10 minutes. What a lucky escape. Well, that will do it for today's News Grid. Remember to keep in touch with us on social media. All the different ways to do that on your screen right now. We're back here tomorrow at 1500 GMT. Thanks for watching.